thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Kevin Barney, uh, Director of Sales and Marketing for MBYLL. Quick uh, background on Joe, and I'm sure he'll tell you a little more uh, about himself. But um, Joe is the founder of the Face Off Factory. Uh, he played his uh, college ball at Rutgers and then was drafted by the Boston Cannons. So he now plays for the um, Similar to what Kevin said, I've been at this for about five years now. Um, I've coached college lacrosse and played professionally each of those last five years following college. And all of this is just kind of the evolution of all the methodology that I've put in place and seen to be really effective with kids of all ages. So my goal for you guys today is to leave feeling a little bit more confident about how you can teach your face-off guys and develop them without being a, a say, a specialized face-off coach. So if any of you guys um, are following along with the document, we're just gonna be going right through it um, throughout the session. So themes and goals to teach the most effective face-off methods, show you guys how to implement them. I wanna teach you guys the rules, limitations, and guidelines surrounding the position, just so everybody's clear on that, because often the officials aren't clear on that. And if you can coach your guys how to be most effective within the rule set, I think that sets them up for prolonged success. And then I just wanna motivate you guys to teach multiple players to face off at young ages. I know that's something that I was kind of drawn into early Early on in my career, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, and I never thought that I'd be a face-off guy. I even wasn't recruited to college to play at Rutgers as specifically a face-off guy, but it's a skill set that I'd kept in my back pocket and continued to work on. And now here I am facing off at the professional level, something I've never seen. But had I not been forced or encouraged to do it from a young age, I probably never would have even in college. So no youth player should ever be a FOGO and no midfielder that you guys coach should never take a face-off. All right. So we'll start with stance and grip. And when looking at stance and grip, it's pretty obvious when you guys see elite or college or even really good high school players, most of them are facing off knee down moto grip. And they're doing that for a reason because it's giving them the most success. Now, just in terms of our grip, I'm going to back this up a little bit and show you guys a little more specifically. So we grip the plastic or when we grip the stick, obviously you can't touch the plastic. You're supposed to have different colored tape for high school or youth rules. Then the color of your gloves, the color of the head, and the color of the shaft. So obviously white on white wouldn't work, but your kids can grip that stick all the way up to the plastic. Now, one thing that I teach kids is if you guys are coming down and you're thinking you're having a problem and you see that the other kid's hands a little bit up on that plastic, yes, we're not encouraging you to cheat, but that's something often that refs are going to let slide as the game goes on. So if you see somebody else with that hand up there, you should probably do the same thing and save your complaining or your ask to the official for later on, all right? Now, our hand cannot be gripping this plastic, but as you guys see, this stick that I have here has a shorter throat, right? This stick is specifically made for facing off. So if you have a kid who's going out to take the face off and his plastic comes all the way down to about here, that half inch makes the world of difference. So I would highly encourage, even if you guys have one stick for the entire team to use, make sure you get a stick with a shortened throat. It'll really help your guys. When we grip our stick with that right hand motorcycle grip, one thing I like to think about <clears throat> and translate a lot of our face off stuff to really just punching and extending this right elbow. So our mechanics need to mimic that. So I see kids come in or they grip the stick to the side or really loose. And when they hear the whistle and squeeze, it takes them half a second to get to that strong punch point, right? So when I'm watching film on a lot of top guys that I'm scouting, playing against, or even myself, the goal is to hold this stick loosely so that someone could pick my hands up off the ground, but firm enough where I don't have to waste any time to get to this strong punch position, all right? So what I like to say is you wrap your fingertips around that stick, and then I'm gonna slide it right under, which allows me to snap downward on the ball. Next, my left hand. If you guys look at the butt end, I like to say for my younger guys, put your elbow down the butt end, grab up, and then just slide down a little bit towards the bottom where it's most comfortable, or try to fit it right around your hips. Now, this is kind of a good balance between being a little bit wider than shoulder width apart, so I'm going to be strong in the leverage game, but also the further I move this butt end down, the further it goes away from the ball. So that's going to slow my hand speed down a little bit and take me upfield rather than into that ball, which is the whole goal. So we want to be about three quarters of the way down so it could fit around our hips. And my left hand is also gripping the stick firmly, but relatively loose so that when I squeeze and snap, 
my stick is again angling downward, all right? So if we have any questions just in terms of grip, we could start there. I'm gonna give you guys just a little brief inch on neutral grip, more comfortable with this and it's coming back. So when we go neutral, kind of ca caveat with it is you see a lot of kids put their thumb up like this and they're trying to stab in. We wanna mimic the same motions of trying to go downward and into the ball. So what I like to say is if they're gonna grip at neutral grip fingertips and then wrap them like half a ring up that shaft so we can still get a little bit of turn down with that right wrist and punch into the ball properly. All right, now, when we're down in that stance, the ball and everything is on our right, okay? So if I were to come down and line up, the ball starts a little bit higher than the middle of the stick, and the top of my stick has to line up to the throat of my opponents. That's called top to stop. And as you guys have probably seen, the officials point to a spot, both guys are supposed to line up with the ball in the middle of that spot or their stick in the middle of that spot, and they're going to place the ball down next. You cannot move after the ref says set. So I see a lot of younger players who get fidgety and try to adjust their stance after the ref says set. That is technically a violation. So once that ref says set, you can no longer move. So in coaching your guys, I would try to tell them and encourage them to get down on that down call and be set before he says set. Now, and a lot of younger players, even high school, college, pro guys, I find when they talk to the ref or the other guy, they're not very focused. And I find a huge correlation with them going early after speaking prior to the face-off. Go in, lock in on that ball, and think about nothing else. So when we're looking at the ball, rather than just looking at the ball, I tell my students to take a deep breath out on down and just try to regulate your breathing don't think about it whatsoever and you want to pick out like a smudge a letter a line and just laser focus lock in on that part of the ball and that's a great way to just set yourself up for being focused being ready and having success at that face off next when talking about our angles or like referencing boxing, everything needs to be on a straight line. We're trying to get from point A to point B as fast as possible, especially when talking about something like a face-off, which can be over as quick as say, you snap your fingers, right? We cannot have any efficiency. So a lot of what we're going to teach you guys today is about maximizing the efficiency of your player's motions, right? So if I back this up a little bit and I give you guys almost like a live, little demo if I come down in this stance with the ball lined up in my stick I want this right knee pointed on almost a 45 degree angle maybe even a little bit more to that ball so I'm gonna dig this right toe into the ground like a sprinter so I can push off of it I'm gonna get this left foot outside my butt end and make sure that I'm turning it towards that ball, so both my hips are pointed at that ball. I give my knee a little bit of space for my right hand so that I can extend those arms when I punch, and I'm upright with my chest, and my elbows are slightly bent. If I start really bent, I'm aiming my punch forward. You can see if I take my pointer finger off my stick, it's gonna be punching low, straight forward, and that's not what we wanna do. The ball starts in the middle, like I said, in that top to stop, we need to come down over the top of the ball and we need to punch to the right to shoot it right into the throat of our stick. All right, so the two directions we're always teaching our, our students to clamp is down, and I call it down the line, or pinky to the ball. So in this motorcycle grip, you wanna roll this wrist back a little bit and bend your elbow, say just enough so that when you extend and get locked out, you can punch a little bit past that ball if that's upright any motion this way with my left shoulder causes me to go away from the ball so I almost tell my guys to work on just doing their first movement as soon as they make contact with someone else's stick that's when we think about going upfield getting around the ball and making that second move so just to recap with stance right knee is pointed on a 45 at the ball it's about in the middle of my hands maybe two inches away from my right hand my left foot sits just outside my butt end and again I'm up on those toes like a sprinter my hips shoulders head everything is pointed directly at that ball so when I punch it's a straight line with my right elbow at that ball and I always say if I was going to punch a punching bag I wouldn't want to side swipe or bend this elbow off because I'm wasting time and energy I need to extend and punch as straight as possible
we talked about the principles always going down that line that's probably the first thing i like to teach with my guys and punching towards the ground so we kind of we have this library on our face off factory online and this is something that i kind of have been working with kev on and giving you guys all access so when you're looking for something say like down the line like we're about to show you guys hey guys today marks the Focus on since our first session is something pretty simple, but I think all face-off guys need to work on, which is eliminating elbow flare. And my best reference I use, and a lot of my Massachusetts guys will know this, is when you guys punch at that ball, think of a boxer. A boxer doesn't punch somebody like this. They snap that arm, although we want to avoid being totally on the void movements. The best so this way is a really easy drill to do for guys on their own, as well as against like a half clamp. To do it is to play this game I like to call just down the line. So I'm going to start with the ball at the top of the stick. And the reason why we're working on this is now more than ever with the top of the stop thing, we have to get down the line and elbow flare is going to make our clamp really inefficient and really unsuccessful. So I'm going to start with the ball all the way at the top of my stick. I'm going to utilize good technique and I'm just going to try to slam that ball into my ball stop. Got me? So about 10, maybe 15 reps. There's a few variations of ways we can do it. My guys who like to close their hands and be really light, you can start really light, almost over exaggerated, and pop that ball right in the throat. Now you guys get the concept, right? So as easy and as simple as that sounds, that's a great way to practice over punching down that line. So someone who just practices with the ball in the middle of their stick, they're not going to be able to slam their plastic through yours if your like if your muscle memory is ingrained that you're going a, like a whole nother inch past them so that's a really big way i think to just properly instill that technique now we talk about our right hand ways things that i say is hey we're just going to try to slam that pinky into the ball and slice it and my thumb now snaps 45 degrees diagonal and that'll give us that nice extension with our right elbow and our left hand. A lot of people have been taught to just extend that left hand out. But again, the ball starts on the right side of our body or 45 degrees away from us. So one thing I like to say is if we think about it like a clock, 12 o'clock straight forward, one o'clock, two o'clock, the ball really sits at about 2.30, right? So our left hand needs to aim exactly there to help our right hand out. And I have another link um, that we're gonna check out for our left hand motion. A family coach, Art Valley here with another episode of Workout Wednesday. One topic that we've kind of received some requests about is our left hand punch. And I think we can work on this in a variety of ways. And today I'm gonna to share two things with you guys that I think, and they're just small, like kind of basic things that I think can really help you if you implement effectively in your practice. The first one we've talked about before is our first move face-offs, right? So I'm just working on this first move, and I want to give myself kind of like a barrier. Let's use this mini stick that I can't clamp past, right? So I know if I throw my body or my stick anywhere towards this barrier, that I'm probably overshooting. And imagine there's a wall right over this line. We don't really want our body to cross it, all right? So set nice and tight every single time with that left hand and we don't want to just go down that line we want to come diagonal so if we even angle this stick like this we know that we have to come on that diagonal as we clamp and my butt end if you set it up properly should just barely hit that stick every single time second thing that i think can help improve just the motion of our left hand. And we've done left hand only clamps before, and we're gonna build upon that. Similar to our right hand stuff, if we grip the stick just with our left hand, we're gonna choke up a little more, and we're just working on that diagonal and downward motion with my left. As you can kind of get that motion down and continue to get the ball in the throat and feel comfortable, you can start with two hands on the stick. Right hand is gonna be very loose, so let me punch that left hand. We're just gonna let that right hand go and kind of follow our stick to build. Now, as you guys kind of see there, 
that is like a super simple way to just make sure you're being extremely efficient with your motion. So I always talk to kids and say, what's faster, a short motion or a long motion? Obviously, a short motion is much faster. So if we can make that first move in our face off, which is arguably the most essential because like we said, a face off can be over in half a second. If we can make that first move as short and as quick as possible. You're setting those kids up for success as they kind of progress through their training. Next, initial techniques. Now, there's a lot of ways to clamp the ball, right? I'm sure you guys have all seen it, even with maximum or limited knowledge of the face-off. Kids lift their left hand. Some kids don't punch it at all. Some kids go right into that rotation around it. Some people try to scrape it out quickly. There's a lot of ways to skin the cat here when we're talking about face-offs. However, I've kind of found that if you're drilling each of these ways to kind of face off or use your left hand, to punch and change your initial move, you're doing a good job setting yourself up to be able to understand and make adjustments when necessary. And this is something that I think is really important when you're having your guys drill, say during practice, even if it's on their own, tell them to practice different moves against each other. And what I mean by that is if you're drilling low clamps, let you have them do each stand, how to react when their opponent's doing something that may be giving them trouble, all right? So here's another clip that we're gonna watch. I'll show you guys, and this just kind of shows you ways to drill this on your own, but also I think it's really important to, like I said, drill it with a part move into an exit, right? We're not playing out the ground balls, but you want them to think critically about, hey, I did this, what was the result when he was doing that, all right? Is clamp variation. So most of you guys know what I'm talking about when I say clamp, clamp variation, but for those of you who don't, I'm talking about people who clamp with their left hand low, who punch their left hand up a little bit, or for people who straight up pinch. While there are advantages and disadvantages for all three, I'm going to show you how to work on all three so you at least have three different types of clamps that you can throw at somebody and change it up to give you other options as things might have to go in your way. So the first one is our standard clamp with our left hand low. And Similar to that down the line drill we worked on last week, we're gonna keep that left hand low and drop all our weight through the ground, try to shoot the ball, reach the ball stop. Second clamp variation is kind of like a mid pinch. And a lot of guys train on keeping their left hand low, but when they face off in a game and they're not thinking about it, they pinch that left hand up. So why not practice it a little bit? I'm gonna pinch about knee height, and I'm not gonna to focus too much on punching out, but more so getting down the line and over that ball so I can sink it right in the throat of my stick very quickly. Lastly is a high pinch, and this is for people who may be faster than their opponent and want to get in and out. We're still going to push off our toes, get down that line, but we're going to bring that left hand almost straight up to try to grab a piece, if not the full thing, and get that ball out. Thanks for watching. I'll see you. So as you, can, you guys can see, it's very simple, but the, the main concept there is the trajectory at which I attack the ball changes each time I change that level or height of my left hand. So those are ways to practice and kind of work on your clamp against what you may see in a game. Now, initial techniques, we talked about those. The one that I didn't hit on is a clamp and rotate. So a clamp and rotate is when you kind of utilize one of those first moves and go right into your secondary part of your face-up, trying to get your body and hips out to 12 o'clock. Now, I think as a game goes on, this is something you read and react to. If you feel like you're tying up with your guy or your students are tying up with their guys and they're doing circles around the ball, a half clamp, if I were to just show you guys right here, if my partner's about to clamp the ball, I'm just covering half of it because if he pushes forward at all, he pushes that ball into my stick. So what he really needs to do is attack down this line and shoot the ball into his throat. And what you'll find is his plastic slides right underneath mine by properly going down the line. And the target really is his fist is aiming right at my shooting strings. The, the throat of his stick ends up right on that ball. Next, talking about tie-ups. Whenever you have guys who've faced off before and may be pretty experienced, you're not going to have a ton of clean wins or a ton of clean losses, or at least you'd hope not. So what we like to kind of discuss is usually the guy who moves second first wins when the, the initial speed battle is pretty even. So similar to any athletic stance, and you want to think wrestlers in terms of this tie-up strategy, feet wide, butt high, head low, and you want your knees 
or your shoulders inside your knees and your arms slightly bent. And the key in any tie-up situation is making sure that with this top edge, you have contact with the ball. Once you lose contact with your top edge to the ball, that's when you're pretty much out of hope and have to revert to playing defense in that face-off. So we've uh, kind of developed and experimented with a ton of different ways that you can rep out tie up situations you can play from in front you can play from behind by giving one guy a little bit more a little bit less they could start perfectly equal you could have one guy go one move at a time but here we'll show you guys um our tie up sequence so there's three different ways when you're tied up with somebody you can get your bottom sidewall or your top sidewall rail underneath theirs to get over that ball so i'm gonna have max come down with me and I'll show you guys. So if we simulate a perfect tie-up, the first one is to get down that line. I can push that ball into my throat and get underneath his stick. The second way, Max is going to show you guys, if I have the pressure down and I'm holding, he can lift his left hand to transfer his weight downward towards the ball to get underneath my plastic. The third way, which most of you guys already know, you may not know that you know, but it's to just traditionally get around that ball and drive over that top sidewall. So now, as I do this one, this is that clamp and rotate we're talking about. Rotate, Watch how my right? We're trying to get a better angle. See, Max is in that position now. His butt's high, his head is low, and his feet as are wide. As soon as we get – Right? And see, I get there. And one thing I would say I do a better job of him here is you look at the trajectory of my back. I'm pointing more down, whereas his back's a little bit flatter. We want to make sure we're getting all our weight down. Because we through can that drive. Back. And if we stay short and light – or short and choppy, I, I like to call it, with these motions where we're not overextending our arms to this shoulder of him, meaning Up I over that ball. angle. So a drill that we've kind of been doing is we've been taking reps that we designed, I'd say, a week ago. Come down the Max. It's called offense, defense, and tie-up. So Max is going to play offense first, which means we're going to simulate that perfect tie-up. We're both going to hold. I'm on defense, so he gets to make the first move. Each move is distinct from one another. So he moves, then I move, and we kind of go back and forth until one of us can get the ball. And each time we're trying to get the ball, or as much of the ball as possible. So ready, Max? And the reason we would do this where we slow it down is so guys can see which moves that they're doing or how they're kind of putting their pressure into the ball, how effective it actually is. So it's a little bit of a trial and error kind of game where we're just simulating micro situations and trying to further like develop the understanding of face off students. Start, and I'm going to call it if I'm on defense. Down, set, go. All right, he moves. Now my turn. And I would have won that one. Now, we'll let him play off. When you guys get the point, you could have both guys doing it, um, just kind of alternating. And that allows you to really figure out doing a good job playing things. No face-off situation is ever going to be perfect. So you want to do everything you can to prepare yourself for both sides of that battle. Now, pinching the ball. I like to talk tie-ups before pinching because I think in reality you see more – tie-up situations than clean pinches however we clamp and rotate around the ball to secure it we pinch the ball to direct it or try to put it where we want so just giving you guys a quick demo i don't know if anyone has their stick when you clamp the ball and i see a lot of guys do this incorrectly the biggest thing when i pinch is that my right hand is not pushing forward you see how the stick flexes forward that means i'm not going to be able to go out the front if my stick weren't a little bit too pinched. My right wrist comes back and my pinky stuff's down. So I'm pressing this way. And as I'm doing that, all I'm doing with this left hand is smashing it up and then pulling back to my body. And the reason we pull it back to our body is so we can lock it in, fight through any pressure, or anyone trying to counter us and still exit effectively. All right. And when pinching the ball, I got another drill for you guys. Um, I think the biggest thing is you got to, especially with younger players, make sure they practice it countless times where they're using all their strength and all their weight. A lot of young players aren't strong enough to pinch some of these stiffer sticks, especially if it's not a face-off stick. So what we want to like tell them is, hey, lean, push off your toes, use your shoulders, use your head, get everything you can weight-wise over that stick so it flexes a little bit more and you really lock that ball into the throat. And 
the reason we always talk about pinching well after going down the line, if the ball's not in the throat when you try to pinch it, you're probably not going to get the ball anyway. So we need to really perfect that clamp motion and getting the ball in the throat before we're even able to jump into pinching the ball. What's going on, guys? Coach Chris May. Um, another version of Workout Wednesday here today. What we're going to focus on today is pinching and securing the ball um, after we have the clamp and before we exit. Well, this might seem a little basic for some of you older guys. Um, I've noticed that a lot of younger guys tend to struggle with this. Um, you know, they'll get the clamp, secure the clamp, and when it comes time to exit, they'll either break it out somewhere with no control or they'll leave the ball behind. So a great way to fix this and to work on our technique is um, – to really focus on what makes a good uh, a good pinch. So what happens here, we clamp down on the ball, first move, we're ready to exit. What we really wanna keep in mind is having pressure on this right hand. And we wanna use our left hand, guys, to manipulate that plastic, okay? Um, a lot of coaches we have say a good, uh, aiming point is to have that butt end go to your armpit. And that actually is a great point because that'll allow us to, once we get that clamp down, to wedge that ball right into the back of our stick, okay? So from here, we can go through a little progression. We can go from you know, our first move, you know, wedge that in nice and secured there, exit. You get that foot off the ground, we can work on dragging it, creating space from that one spot. Um, but one thing we always want to make sure, and what I think is the key to a good exit, is getting this um, really good, hard pinch on the ball, manipulating that plastic, having that ball secured in the back. Um, so one more time, guys. Clamp down on the ball, pressure down on the right hand, lift that left, butt into your armpit, feet, and then you can control wherever you want to go, right? Um, so again, it seems really basic, but I think he does a great job breaking it down. And with a lot of these drills through self-practice, you can perfect this. I've seen kids, even at the Division One level, who've never been coached before, and they're seemingly better than a lot of these other guys because they're hungry to do a lot of this stuff on their own. And that's kind of the whole point of us having this library is to give you guys access to coach your kids as much or as little um, as they kind of are willing to go. Now, um, I kind of have a little bit more of a fun drill called Fireball um, that I'm going to show you guys. And this is a great way for anyone who may be a little bit more advanced to kind of work on their speed coupled with this um, subject of pinching the ball. So then I, uh, I recently did with my college guys at UMass Boston. Set. And we're just aiming. Nice. Down. At this helmet. Set. Good. Make sure we turn and take that cut off step down. Here can, like, rush him set. through his sequences. So he really has to get set Good. as fast as possible. Down. He has to get back down and stand as set. fast as possible. He has to really punch and get into the ball as fast as possible. Set. And now, as we kind of add degrees of difficulty. I want you to either lightly bounce it, right, or roll it to here. Yes. This is kind of that happy me. I want you to either lightly bounce it, right, or roll it to here. Yes. This is kind of that happy median about five or six yards where you could pick this up yourself or box your guy out and let our wing guy pick it up. All right, we ready? Down. Get to those feet, see your target, just like you're hiking in a football through those legs. Set. Down, softer, more touch. So we're actually doing this each direction with these guys so that they're working on popping the ball out to all four quadrants of the field. And so now we're going to work on tossing it out of rotations. Really you're going to come down. You're going to be the one clamping. Like you're going to come down on the same side of the line. All right, so come over here. Flip your stick around. You go lefty half. Next, following pinching the ball is talking about, like, escaping that face-off dot, right? A lot of people refer to it as exiting, Okay. And again, the goal of pinching and exiting, like we want to get possession of the face off. So you could do this, like practice clamping as much as you want, practice pinching as much as you want, but unless you can simulate <clears throat> something a little bit more game-like, whether it's the opponent giving you resistance, 
you guys incorporating a wing drill, which we have plenty of into this face off. The goal is to get your guys to be able to exit under duress and pressure because that's how it's going to be in a game. And I don't think that enough coaches prepare their face off guys for this by just having them face off one on one on the side. So we have a couple fun drills that you could even do with a few people um, that I think have been really beneficial both for my own game and a lot of these guys that I'm working with um, to allow them to be as good as possible in these uh, tie-up situations. How's it going, guys? Welcome back to another episode of our rotations that we worked on last week that I call mobile escapes. We're going to do a couple different rotation variations, and then we're going to pop the ball to some of our stationary exit points or escape points from uh, each spot that we end up in our rotation. So the first one, we're going to keep it really simple. And I like, love doing this with my college guys because we change it up and try to make it as complicated as possible so that in any game you could react to any unexpected circumstance, I should say, and be totally fine and comfortable execution. So the first one we're going to do full screw or rotation, and I'm going to drop step and pop the ball backwards. He's semi often. I am going to actually go quarter screw forward and I'm going to go right pop backwards. The Noted. biggest thing I would say when watching some of this stuff is like, you see how distinct each motion is right here? When you're drilling, it's all segmented. So not only does that allow you to practice it better, but when you're in a game and you're kind of on autopilot, if you practice it step by step and make sure your kids practice it step by step, it'll stick with them much more naturally and be very fluid when they don't have to think about it. Because in a game, you don't have time Notice, to I'm think. I'm my arm, flicking that ball on the ground. So all my motion. Last one I'm going to give you guys. We're going to go half screw to a pop directly to our left. If someone were to cut us off going forward, we can turn that foot and go left. That's when we're going to execute. <laughs> And notice every time I'm dragging a foot or two away from that dot, and that's something that allows me to create space while I'm trying to get away from my opponent. So a lot of times you see guys struggle to gain separation. That drag is a great way to kind of bend the rules but not break them because similar to traveling in basketball, they say you get one step. So as soon as that pivot foot comes off the ground, refs are usually quick to blow that whistle for withholding. Now, as we kind of progress following exits, we talked about neutral grip a little bit. And I would recommend if your kids are going to face off neutral grip, like say you have a long pole or a kid who's pretty athletic and you want to see a lot of the ground ball situation, I would recommend that they actually try going stand up neutral grip. And we actually have a couple of videos on this. But the reason being is neutral grip, not only with that underhand motion and kind of grip of the stick, allows you to attack the ball at a different angle, similar to the moves we talked about earlier. Neutral grip allows you to be on your feet, not have to flip your hands, and be ready for any ground ball situation. Also, if you find that your opponent is strong and he pushes the ball a little bit, in neutral grip, they actually will almost give you the ball, and it'll allow for much quicker exits and face-offs um, than any knee-down motor grip tie-up, whatever yield. We kind of cue this one up. I think neutral grip is something I've tried to really get in on and I feel like I am pretty good at it um but as I kind of said before people face off knee down moto grip for a reason because it's the most successful you're using all these strong muscles on the front of your body rather than like these smaller ones kind of on the underside of that arm so that's really my ideology behind not making it like my primary go-to and not using it more than say a couple times a game because when you're going against high-level competition, every single face-off counts. So I think that would really be the only thing I would say. Like, the better your opponent, the less likely it is that you may beat him going neutral grip. Now, before I kind of start with this video, this kid, Hunter Forbes, actually is a knee-down neutral grip guy. Um, he's someone that works with us at Face-Off Factory. He played at Jacksonville. He was 70% as a senior 
in division one going neutral grip. And for him, I think he found it to be much faster, allowed him to get down over the ball more. So he's someone who could probably coaches better than I ever could. Um, and I think he's hey guys, a great one to listen to on this subject. It's Hunter Forrest from Jacksonville, Florida. And for this week's workout Wednesday, I'm going to show you a look kind of unique uh, and new technique that I've been using, knee down neutral grip. All right. So for and now just um, kind of a brief like disclaimer. Anyone can do all of this stuff from stand-up stance. So for me, I think it makes more sense to go stand-up neutral grip. For him, it's a little bit quicker. Like I said, there's several ways that you can kind of win face-offs no matter what you have. Um, so all of this stuff could be easily transformed into going stand-up neutral grip. This stance, I'm going to go down in a stance that I would use for any other kind of grip, moto or neutral. And so I'm going to stand like this, and what it looks like when I clamp, I'm going to pull back my left hand a little and just lift it off the ground maybe just an inch. What this does is it shoots my top sidewall forward into the ground, which gives me control of the ball quicker than my opponent by if he's punching his left hand forward. So it kind of looks like this. I'm lifting up my left hand while clamping down, looking at that. You can see, you want to get a little closer, you can see uh, it's shooting that sidewall into it, and it's important when you do this, that you're punching down the line to get make sure the ball is going to the strong part of the sidewall. So when I'm down, I'll clamp, throw my stick down, and I'll uh, throw it down the line and get that strong part of the stick over the ball pretty quick. Um, shortly after doing that, I'll punch my left hand forward because in a tie situation, it is important that you uh, do use your left hand at least a little bit. And so I'm not just totally pulling it back. I pull it back, clamp forward. And then I'll push it forward to secure the ball if you were to have some of it. Um, some some pros I like of this stance and technique is that, one, I think I'm quicker with natural grip. My hands are a lot lighter. Um, another one is that you're already holding the stick, obviously, in the way you would carry it and scoop the ground ball. So there's no transferring. You can just catch it easier, scoop the ground ball easier. And although people uh, think you're less powerful, with neutral grip, if you use the technique of pulling back your left hand, throwing that sidewall, and strong part of the stick into the ball, you'll find you can actually get a lot more powerful as well. So that's why I, that's why I've been using. It. It's been working out pretty. So again, little different spin on it, um, but I think he does a great job of making this effective because he's found that it makes him faster. And like I said, speed is key. So if you feel faster doing something, that should be what you stick with. <laughs> Talking both offensively and defensively about the faceoff, obviously there's going to be games where you don't have your best stuff or your kid doesn't have his best stuff, and he has to be prepared with a backup plan. So I think something we've done a really good job of um, in teaching is how to be effective countering, right? So you don't want some guy to be just a counter faceoff guy that probably won't take him very far. But if your primary face-off guy can learn some counters, not only can he keep opponents guessing and on their toes strategically, but he can set his clamp up for more success. Because if I'm going against him and I'm like, dang, he got me on a couple of these like gimmicky moves, I now have to think about that. So I'm not focused on what I'm doing. So that's probably the biggest thing that I think you could instill upon your guys is Number one, if you're going to counter, you're going to lose clamps. It's an attitude and effort thing to get that ball back. All right. Not every face off is going to be perfect, but you can make it work. So we do a drill situation you may be put into in a game. Now, his opponent's job, the disadvantaged guy, is to stand up, react, cut off that fast break, and try to win that ground ball back. And you can play for points when you do this, where whoever is advantaged gets one point for a ground ball win, disadvantaged guy gets two points for a ground ball win or you could add push-ups, you could be creative with it. But that's a way that I found you can kind of get your guys to learn how to scrap is making them play out of losses. Next, you can do what we said earlier, situational face-offs where one guy is clamping, you're telling him how you want him to exit based on the opponent you might be going against this week. And the other guy is exclusively using counter moves and, so, and he has to change it up. So I like teaching a scissor rake, a laser, a jam. Um, we can just show you hand-wise. And obviously you guys will have this on the recording. If I'm raking the balls here, I want my stick to be extremely loose and light. And I almost want to pre 
float it back. So just a hair. And the goal is to get this bottom rail into my opponent's stick. So when I say like a laser rake, my right hand's light and loose. I'm trying to come under and slice. And my left hand is actually going to start curled. So I get more yank down that line. So on the whistle, I'm slicing and pulling. And I'm trying to grab his mesh and lift him off the ground. Now, if I wanted to do a scissor rake, I'd take a wider approach in my stance. I'm gonna do that same slice motion, but I'm gonna pull my left hand between my legs so I get even more torque. And what you find is when you get this guy's stick or get his mesh with your stick, you can lift up and that ball will pop out and be a perfect 50-50. And things that I've found that guys have been surprised about is when you curl that left hand up, you get so much more yank down that line with this rake that that alone can give guys an immense amount of trouble. Looking through um, some kind of wing sets and wing play, I think this is actually something that is completely undercoached at all levels. And just by giving you guys a little bit of a sense of some things that may work or some sets that I've used in the past, I think you guys could set your face-off guys up for success. So before we even talk about packages or actual wing play, the first thing is what are your guys' strengths, what are you trying to accomplish, and where do you find the ball mostly goes in the face-off. So if I have a kid who can only go backwards, but he's really good at winning it to himself, I should be forcing the opponents upfield so that he can get a one-on-one -on -one ground ball almost every every time. I think a lot of guys try to bring their wings into the party and it congests and creates some chaos up there where in reality that face off if you have the advantage you should try to make it as much of a one on one as possible. Now, I've timed it probably 10 times or so when watching film. It takes some of the fastest kids in the division 1 about 3 or 4 seconds to get from that wing line to the face off dot if they're untouched. Now, if I have a wing guy who just makes a little bit of contact or bumps him, that time it takes to get the, those wings, the dot, turns into about six or seven seconds. So you're almost doubling your face-off guy's time to get the ball to himself just by making contact on the wings. And you don't have to grab or hold the guy, but you can shoulder him, you can give him a little bit of a hip check, try to deter him from getting into that what we call a circle or that soccer circle around the face-off. And I think if – you have a guy who's losing more face-offs than he's winning. You want to do everything you can to get those wing guys involved. So something that I've always liked to teach is you can kind of call it like a hook where you start with your stick in front of that guy, right? Or if he's on the wrong side, you can kind of start with your butt end in front of him. And what you're trying to do is you're almost trying to grab a piece of him and step through to gain that advantage off that initial whistle off the line because that first guy in can usually be the one to wreak some havoc and get that ball on the ground for you guys. Hey, Joe, we do have a couple of questions on the Q&A. I don't know if you want to finish up yeah. uh, with those. Yeah. What counters should be most practiced? I think you could work on that scissor and laser rake, and if you have someone, say, practice that for 10 to 20 minutes, um, pull doing it and going against it, they're going to be so much better once they actually practice it a lot. Um, I know it's, it's definitely something that is tough when you're going against a superior clamper, but the goal when you practice counter moves is to try to add a little bit of a spin on each, each time you do it. So for me, I've found that slicing that right hand in and pulling that left hand works the best. That may not work the best for your kids, right? They may be better starting with a little bit of pressure on their hands than being light. But I think if they're able to kind of experiment and find what works, now they're going to know when they see certain things in a game, how to do it. We didn't really get into jam. I don't know how to ref the jam and they call kids as soon as their kind of hand touches the other the opponent's plastic. So I would say the two best ones you could practice pre-whistle are that scissor rake and our laser rake they're very similar but they can both be super super effective now post whistle counters are a little bit different and i think when talking about post whistle counters you want to always attack the right glove of your opponent so one that's extremely legal i think works very well is when someone locks that ball in it's called the shovel i'm going to try to use my right hand to hit right underneath his right hand my opportunity is when he goes to pinch the ball if i come underneath and lift 
hand to hand or glove to glove under that stick, you can lift him right off the ball. Another one is I like to just call it straddle his stick. So if my opponent has this clamp down right here, I want to put one foot on each side of the head of his stick. I want his helmet to be right in front of my stomach. And now anytime he moves or rotates, again, I'm trying to keep that stick straddled, and I'm just being patient and playing defense. And you'd be shocked how many kids will mess that up when someone is right in their grill, giving them pressure on that secondary part of the faceoff hole, where I like to call it like a post-whistle counter move. All right. Next, um, when you send a long pull out, do you want them to make a move and try to shift the ball on his opponent's stick, or do you want them to go straight for the hands? I would say if he goes straight for the hands, you're more likely to get called. Now, if you're going against a kid who's an absolute animal and he's not going to sniff the ball on a clamp anyway, um, your long pull, that is, I would say to stand up, wait for that opportunity where he lifts that hand, and that's when you can go for his hands and check. I think if you check him while he's on the ground or trying to create space for himself, you're asking for trouble. However, the goal when you send a pull out there is not to put a pull out there is never practice facing off. You need this kid to feel like he's at least ready because when you think about it and break it down, that face off guy who's beating your guys who are practicing probably has thousands of whistles of experience in his head. And if you send a long pull out who hasn't even taken, say, a couple hundred face offs, he's probably doomed anyway. So you need to practice first and foremost for the long pole. But I would say if you can get them to practice that initial move with his hands, the only difference with those rake moves is you can't pull the stick between your legs with a long pole. So I would start with both hands a little higher up, curl that left wrist, and you're making that same laser rake move. And as you're doing it, you're stepping to the right to prevent him from going forward. So as soon as we miss and he gets that ball, your stick's right up and you can check. And I would always say if you're having a long pull face off, he should be neutral grip and standing up because you kind of negate that advantage if he has to flip his hands or get to his feet that he has with that six-foot pull. Best way to introduce the face off position to younger kids. I think video is probably the best way these days. Kids live and love, live for and love um, all the video and content that's available on the internet. Um, so if you can show them a couple things that they may think is cool about facing off, they're going to be interested right away. And now I think building for younger kids, the two biggest things, because not a lot of them are strong enough to rotate is teaching them to clamp properly, just getting it in the throat, teaching them body positioning and good stances. I find that a lot of younger kids have terrible stances because they don't like to be detailed about it. You just got to harp on them initially. Um, and once they kind of get the groove of it and feel comfortable, they won't fight you. Um, but I think if you can get them to clamp, have a good stance and pinch the ball or be able to pop it a couple different directions, you're going to be in great shape. And that'll kind of lead to some prolonged success.